Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to Mr. Saucedo's YouTube videos. Today, we're going to be going over part of chapter one, which is from Zumdahl, seventh edition. Um, again, because this PowerPoint is from a different edition, some of the sections won't exactly match up, but still feel free to follow along with your notes and follow along with your book. So we're going to be talking about types of chemical reactions and specifically solution stoichiometry. So the first section is about water. So something that you need to be aware of is obviously something that you know already about water. It can dissolve many different types of substances. So primarily the ones that we're interested in though are polar substances and ionic substances. So you already know what ionic bonds are, you already know what an ionic compound is. Polarity, eh, you know, that's less of a thing we're going to be talking about immediately. But for now, all you really need to know is that water is polar. And the reason why it's polar is because of an unequal charge distribution. So if we look at a water molecule drawn traditionally in a particle diagram, it looks like this. And then if you were to look at it in like a ball and stick kind of model, it looks like this. But something that you should notice here are these two symbols. So we've got a delta symbol with a little positive charge, and then we've got a delta symbol with a little negative charge. So what you should notice are that the hydrogens are the positively charged uh, parts of the water molecule, and the oxygen is the negatively charged part. Now the reason why these are not just pluses and minuses are because this means partial. So it's not a full charge like, you know, an ion would be. Um, it instead is a partial charge, just meaning that, you know, it's uh, it's not quite an ion or anything that we're looking at here. We're still looking at a full molecule. So the dissolution of a solid in water. So what happens when things dissolve? So the most common thing that you'll ever see dissolve in water is salt. So what does it look like when salt dissolves in water? So we've got sodium ions. They're these little uh, positively charged uh, blue things. And then we have the chloride ions, which are these little negatively charged green things. Um, Notice that the chloride ion is a lot bigger, by the way. Um, but what you'll see here is that when salt dissolves in water, uh, notice what's happening with the water molecules. So remember, I told you the shape of the water molecule is very important. So what do we notice if you were looking here? Notice that the negatively charged thing is attracted to these little uh, hydrogens here. So the hydrogens are the positively charged part of the water molecule. And notice that those are what are surrounding the negatively charged chloride ion. Here we have our positively charged um, uh, cation here, and so notice that the oxygens in this situation are the ones that are attracted to it. So part of the reason why ionic substances like salt dissolve so easily in water is because of this type of interaction. So let's go on to section 4.2. So we're going to go with what solutes and solvents are because we're talking about aqueous solutions. So a solute is a substance that is being dissolved in a liquid. Specifically in our case, it's always going to be water. Solvent is going to be our liquid water. It's going to be our dissolving um, mechanism, let's say. And so what you need to be aware of are that electrolytes are substances that when dissolved in water produce a solution that can conduct electricity. So in other words, if we were to dissolve certain substances in water, um, some of them would conduct electricity and others would not. If it conducted electricity, we would consider that an electrolyte. And in reality, there are two types of electrolytes, strong and weak. And uh, that can tell us a little bit about what would happen if we were to make a solution out of that substance. So let's talk about electrolytes. A strong electrolyte conducts current very efficiently, meaning that if we were to stick something in, like, you know, um, a light bulb, let's say, uh, it would make the light bulb shine brightly. And that's because whatever substance we're looking at, that's the strong electrolyte, completely ionizes when it hits water. So what does that mean when we say completely ionizes? Um, that means that it would totally break apart into positive and negative charges. On the other hand, weak electrolytes conduct only a small amount of electricity. And so that means that there is some degree of ionization in water, but it's not 100% like a strong electrolyte would. Now, you might think, are those the only two categories? No, right? Obviously, some things dissolve in water, but don't produce any current at all. And those would be things that are not ionic. So if it's not forming ions, that means that it would be a non-electrolyte. And how can we like figure that out? I'll show you that in a second. So let's look at electrolyte behavior. So here is an example of a strong electrolyte, weak electrolyte, and then a non-electrolyte. So here we have many ions. Notice a lot of positives and negatives. Here we have positives and negatives, but notice that a lot of the molecules are still stuck together. And then here we have no ions at all. It's just those molecules are now floating around in water. 
okay? So again, that's just something that you need to be aware of when we're looking at electrolytes. So how do we represent dissolution? In other words, um, sometimes it's called hydration, but how we are dissolving things in water. How would we represent that? So for electrolytes, what you need to be aware of are that they will break into ions with their respective charges for their cations and anions. So you still have to know what those charges are from the periodic table um, and from our, our list, okay? Now, a good example of that would be how would we write, I want to dissolve some salt in water. How would I write that, re, that, that kind of um, uh, formula. Well, right here I have NaCl as a solid, so notice I have my state of matter here, and then it's breaking apart into Na+, that would be an aqueous um, solution of Na+, and also Cl-, also an aqueous solution. Remember, aqueous means that it is, you know, mixed with water, basically, and so that's what happens when we dissolve something like salt in water. On the other hand, what about non-electrolytes? Instead, all we do is we change the state to aqueous, but it doesn't break apart into ions. So notice here, I had to know that sodium is a plus one, and I had to know that chloride is a minus one in order to do this correctly. If I were to pick a different charge or not have charges, that would be incorrect. So for non-electrolytes, though, um, for example, benzene, uh, benzene dissolves in water and get you get this. You basically just get this, the same exact formula, and I changed it from liquid to aqueous. So in, you know, benzene is a liquid normally, um, and so if you mix it with water, now we have an aqueous solution of benzene, and that's it. So how would you be able to tell if it's a non-electrolyte or not? One of the ways is that molecular compounds or molecular um, things that we've written molecular formulas for, so molecules, right, covalently bonded things, are non-electrolytes because they don't form ions in the traditional sense. So chemical reactions of solutions, on the other hand, you know, section 4.3, the composition of solutions, now we're getting into, okay, how can we quantify this information? So the first thing that you need to know if we are trying to do any kind of chemical stoichiometry with regards to solutions is what kind of reaction are we looking at, and then how much of the chemicals that we're looking at are in the solutions that we're looking at and mixing together. So the first general uh, important definition and formula for this um, section is molarity. So molarity is represented by a capital M, and it's equal to the moles of solute per volume of solution. And specifically, we are looking at that in liters. So this is how we would write that. Molarity equals moles of solute over liters of solution. Notice it's liters of solution. It's not liters of solvent. It's the entire thing when it's mixed together. Now, normally we assume the density of whatever we're looking at is one. So then in reality, it doesn't matter if you're looking at the solvent or the solution, but in some situations that might make a difference. So you might wanna make sure that we have liters of solution and not liters of solvent. So here's a good example. Let's say I have three molar hydrochloric acid. And by the way, I guess I should probably also just kind of let you know, the way that you read this is you would say three molar, not three molarity. So it's a three molar solution of hydrochloric acid uh, that could be made out of six moles of hydrochloric acid and two liters of solution. Simple as that. But think about this, right? There are a lot of ways we could get three, so it doesn't have to be six over two. It could be, you know, 12 over four, or it could be something else, whatever else you wanted to use. So just keep in mind that's how we measure how many moles of something are in that volume of solution. It's using molarity. So here's a good example. Uh, I have a 500 gram sample of potassium phosphate. It's dissolved in enough water to make a 1.5 liter solution. What is the molarity of the solution I'm looking at? So let's break this down. You can try it on your own, but potassium phosphate, first thing I need to know, what is the chemical formula for potassium phosphate? Once I know that, then I can figure out, okay, great, what's the molar mass of it? Once I have the molar mass, I can then convert from grams to moles, right? So let's see if you got potassium phosphate right. So potassium phosphate is K3PO4, potassium is a plus one, phosphate is a minus three. If you add that together, you get about 212.27 grams per mole. Again, your periodic table might give you something slightly different, but still it's pretty close. And then um, once I have that, I would need to convert from grams to moles. So I'd have to go from 500 uh, grams to moles. So how would I do that? I would do this. I would cancel, I'd get 2.355 moles, and then I need to use molarity. And remember, molarity is just this, 2.335 moles over 1.50 liters, simple as that. All right, next. What would that be? It would be 1.57 moles over liters, or molarity, or you could say molar, 1.57 molar. So um, that's what my molarity would be. Okay. 
concentration of ions. All right, so now here's where it gets a little bit more, um, I wouldn't say intuitive, but for some reason this always threw me off whenever I was doing stuff. So I know this like the back of my hand now. But let's say that I have a 0.25 molar solution of calcium chloride. And then I ask you, what is the concentration of calcium ions in this solution? What is the concentration of chloride ions in this solution? Now, I'm not exactly, or at least when I was taking chemistry in college, I wasn't exactly very smart. But um, here's what I would kind of say, right? Oh, it makes sense. It's a 0.25 molar solution, so wouldn't it just be 0.25 molar for everything? Uh, no, it wouldn't. Uh, because think about it, right? Each calcium chloride um, uh, formula unit is made up of one calcium and it's made up of two chlorides. So in reality, if I were looking at like how it dissolves, right, if I, the dissolution of it, it would be this. I'd have my solid, I'd have one calcium ion and I'd have two chloride ions. That means that if I'm looking at the concentrations for calcium, it would just be 0.25 molar, which makes sense, right? There's only one of them. But for the chloride ions, I would have double. I'd have a 0 0.50 molar solution of chloride ions. And so if you're looking at individual ions, it's important to make sure that you know your original formula and that you take the dissolution of it or the hydration of it into account when you're doing your calculations. So for example, let's try this. Which of the following solutions would contain the greatest number of ions? So I don't care. It just says ions. So it could be cations, anions. It's, it's both, basically. So 400 milliliters of 0.1 molar solution of salt water, 300 milliliters of a 0.1 molar solution of what we just found out here, uh, calcium chloride, 200 milliliter of a 0.1 molar solution of iron 3 chloride, or 800 milliliters of a 0.1 molar solution of, I think that's sucrose. So what do you think? Take a guess, and I'll tell you what the answer is. Answer? Da -da -da, right here. So we have 300 milliliters of a 0.1 molar solution of calcium chloride. Now why? Let's actually figure it out. So for A, right, I would have 0 0.080 moles of ions. Now you might think, okay, wait. Okay, I understand this. I understand that. Why times two? Because we have two ions that we're breaking it apart into. It doesn't matter if they're positive or negative, right? Because it just says ions. So I'm looking at this and this. What about B? Remember, I have three because I have two chlorides and I have one calcium for each one. So it would actually be 0 0.09. Now you might think, okay, now it makes more sense. Now C is exactly the same here, right? I have a 0.2 liter solution here of a 0.1 molar and I have four ions. So I have three CLs and I have one Fe3 plus. So that's times four. So that's exactly the same as A. And then here's the tricky one. D doesn't give you any ions because this is a uh, molecular com uh, compound. I, I guess I could say it's a molecular compound, but it's molecular in nature. So it's a non-electrolyte. And since it's a non-electrolyte, it doesn't break up into any ions at all. Okay, so if it asked you which was has the fewest ions, it would be D. D has none. Okay, let's think about this. So what are we going to be looking at when we look at these types of problems? So one of which is, if I'm trying to find the solution that contains the greatest number of moles of ions, what do we need to know? How is this going to work? You could draw a picture. That's one of the ways that they like to represent these things, especially in AP chemistry. So it could be a drawing. Um, they could have you complete a drawing where they have part of this already drawn with ions in it, and they ask you to complete the drawing. Um, could ask you how many moles of each are in the solution. There are a lot of ways of going about this. <clears throat> so what are we going to notice here? So uh, hopefully what you noticed by going through this is that the solution with the greatest number of ions is not necessarily the one that has the largest volume. A lot of times people think, oh yeah, a lot of liquid, you're going to have a lot of stuff floating around in it. In fact, it tends to be the opposite, right? If you have something that's more concentrated, its volume is going to be less, and you're actually going to have more ions floating around in a more concentrated solution. Another thing is that the formula unit... Um, may let you give a clue as to how many ions there are in something. If you have, you know, a lot of ions in your solution and you have a formula unit that you're looking at that has a ton of ions in it, obviously there's going to be a lot of ions in your solution as a result of that, okay? But hopefully, if you go back to the previous question, you realize that just because it, that has a lot of ions and it doesn't mean that it's the one that's going to have the most, right? Because iron 3 chloride had the most ions with 4 but its you know, concentration and its volume were 
you know, in such a way that you didn't actually have the most ions. So just keep that in mind. Now let's talk about dilutions. So dilutions or diluting something is exactly what it sounds like, right? If you're diluting something, you're adding more liquid to it, right? So it's the process of adding water to a concentrated stock solution to achieve the molarity that you desire. And there's a nice little formula for it and everything. Um, the nice thing to know about dilution is dilution with water does not alter the number of moles of solute, right? Because all we're doing is we're adding more volume to our solution. We're not necessarily changing the number of moles of solute that are in it. If I start with 100 moles of something in a solution, which is a lot, by the way, like a lot, a lot, um, and then I add a lot of water to it, I'm still going to have 100 moles of you know solute, but now I'm going to have a greater volume, which means I'm now diluting it, and I'm going to have a molarity that is less. So moles of solute before your dilution equal the moles of solute after your dilution. And there's actually a dilution formula that tells us this. And it's this. The molarity of whatever you started with times the volume that you started with is going to be equal to the molarity at the end times the volume at the end. And the reason why this relationship works is because the moles before is equal to the amount of moles after. And remember, molarity is moles over liters. So if I take moles over liters and I multiply by, you know, a volume, then that means that I'm going to just have moles left over. So here's a concept check for you. I have a 0 0.50 molar solution of sodium chloride in an open beaker. I'm letting it sit on the lab bench. Which of the following would decrease the concentration of my salt solution? OK, so think about it. What if I add more water? What if I pour some of the solution down the drain? What if I add more sodium chloride to it? What if I let it sit out in the air for a couple of days? Or would more than one of these work? Now, let's pick the right answer add water to the solution. Okay, that would be a way of decreasing the salt concentration. Now you might think, hey, what about the rest of these? If you pour some of the solution down the drain, remember, it doesn't matter. The amount of moles that are there are still going to be the amount of moles that are there. So it doesn't matter, right? You're not changing the concentration at all. All you're doing is you're, you know, basically removing volume. That's it. Next, what if I add more sodium chloride? That would increase the concentration right? It would, it would make it more concentrated. If I let it set out for a while, so if I let it set out for a while, it's going to evaporate. That means that, again, it's going to increase in concentration. As liquid is being removed, now all of a sudden I'm going to have a more concentrated solution because the number of moles of solute are still there. So obviously it can't be two of these then, so A is the right answer. What is the minimum volume of a 2 molar NaOH solution needed to make 150 milliliters of a 0.8 molar NaOH solution? Hey, I know what that would look like. Dilution formula. So 2 times V equals 0.8 times 150 milliliters. Now here's a trick for you, by the way. Because um, it doesn't matter, you might think, hey, don't these have to be in liters? They really don't. If you have this in milliliters, this answer will just be in milliliters, okay? So the answer is actually 60 milliliters. All right, next. About types of chemical reactions. So here's the deal. This is going to be a review. So this isn't actually in the book, or at least it's not in my version of the book, but it's something that you should have already learned when you were going through regular chem or honors chem or whatever you took before this. So... Uh, some of this is going to be totally familiar to you, and you're probably just going to be like, okay, I already know all this, which is good. Um, but there are broad types of chemical reactions. We're going to be only looking at precipitating reactions or precipitation reactions. Sometimes that's what I think the book calls it, at least, um, today. But I felt compelled to let you know about these also because they're all over the place. So the first type of chemical reaction is called a synthesis reaction. It's where your elements are combining together to form a compound. So for example, aluminum and chlorine. So if I'm adding aluminum, which is, you know, just solid old aluminum, and I'm adding chlorine gas, which chlorine is a diatomic gas, remember, I would be making aluminum chloride. So it's important that when you are taking elements and combining them together like this, that you remember that they are going to be forming, most of the time, ionic compounds. And these ionic compounds, you need to take the charges into account. Aluminum is supposed to be a plus three, chloride's a minus one. So when you make your little um, ionic compound, you get this. Great. All right, let's balance this, though, because this isn't balanced. It's bugging me. So this is what it would look like balanced. 
All right, what about the next one? Decomposition, that's when a compound is gonna be breaking apart into smaller compounds or also just elements, okay? So a good example, we have sodium bicarbonate. It's breaking apart, what did that look like? So sodium bicarbonate is NaHCO3. Uh, it's a solid. It's going to be breaking apart into, you know, something else. So in reality, when you decompose sodium bicarbonate, you actually end up making carbon dioxide gas and water. Makes sense, right? Look at all of these little elements in here. I could definitely get a water out of this. I could get CO2 out of this. And then you actually make sodium carbonate. Uh, decomposition reactions are not as intuitive, and you might think, how was I supposed to know it was going to break apart into these three things? For some of these things, you just need to remember and to know them. Uh, in reality, um, they will not assume you know every decomposition reaction. You would just need to be able to break this apart into chunks. So if you missed a chunk, eh, okay, it's not the end of the world. Uh, let's, oh, <laughs> That was my bad, though. Uh, let's balance this. That would really bug me if it wasn't balanced, and so I balanced that by putting in two in front there. All right. Single displacement reactions. A more active element will replace a less active element within a compound. When it says active, it's talking about the activity series. It's in your book. It's not really something you need to memorize, other than the fact that alkali metals are extremely active. Let's just say that. All right. So... Active metals can replace elect a less active metal. So sodium plus cobalt two sulfate. Okay, great. So sodium is going to be able to replace the cobalt in this. And so I would end up replacing. So literally, the sodium would push my cobalt out of the way. And I would make now sodium sulfate. And now I would have cobalt all by itself. Notice that, again, these are all ionic things that are happening here. So since they're ionic, I'm still making sure that my sodium and my sulfate have the right balance when I'm making my formula. It's not just NaSO4, that doesn't exist, it's Na2SO4, okay? And then how exactly would I go about, you know, balancing this? So two goes there, then a two goes there, and then it looks like a two goes there, and that's it. All right, what about next? Another little rule for single displacement, active metals can replace hydrogen and water. That's one of the reasons why alkali metals are so dangerous. So let's say I mix potassium and water together. When I mix potassium and water together, what's going to happen is the sodium, or sorry, the potassium is going to be literally ripping apart the hydrogen from the water molecule. And now I have potassium hydroxide and I have hydrogen gas. Once again, this is imbalanced, but I can easily balance that by just doing that. All right, another rule for our nice little single displacement reactions. Um, an active metal can replace hydrogen in an acid. So if I have potassium and I have hydrofluoric acid, the metal can actually replace the hydrogen in the acid that we're looking at. So if I have potassium and hydrofluoric acid, I could actually make potassium fluoride, and I could make, again, hydrogen gas. Again, notice the commonality here. I'm always making hydrogen gas when I do this, and that's because if I am going to be replacing something with a metal, the only thing I can replace in water or in you know something like an acid is the H. So let's balance that to here, to here, to here, and I'm done. All right, last rule for single displacement reactions. Active nonmetals can replace less active nonmetals. So if you look at an activity series, very rarely will you actually see nonmetals, but just realize that, again, they, they exist. Okay, nonmetals exist, and the most active nonmetal is fluorine. Fluorine gas is extremely dangerous. If I mix it with something like barium nitride, I can actually replace the nonmetals. So I can move the nitrogen out of the way and replace it with a fluorine instead. So if I have fluorine gas, remember it's diatomic, I have barium nitride, again, making sure you remember how to crisscross your charges here since it's ionic. I would make barium fluoride, notice again, it's ionic, and then nitrogen gas is getting pushed out. So that's another diatomic gas. So how would I balance that? Uh, let's see, is that right? That looks good. That looks good already. All right, double displacement, which is really what this entire um, part of the unit is about. So Spoiler alert, we're going to go a lot more in detail with this one later on. Um, both cations and anions switch spots. Make sure you recross all your charges on your product side. So what that's talking about is you have something like this, not individual, you know, like in the last one, it was an individual element or a diatomic element mixing with some ionic compound. I have two ionic compounds, silver nitrate, potassium chromate. Okay, so if I was mixing those together, silver nitrate has this formula, potassium chromate has this one. 
what would I do? Well, my silver would push my K here, my potassium, out of the way. And now I have potassium nitrate and I have silver chromate. Okay. Now, if you're wondering, hey, how is this an S and this is a Q? You are thinking ahead, and uh, we'll talk about that in a little bit. But for now, all you need to know is that in a double displacement reaction, you are switching two ions around. So the silver is replacing this, and now that is replacing that. Notice, though, that they're ionic compounds. You have to recross all your charges and make sure that everything is balanced before you move on to the next step. How would I balance it? I'd put a two there, put a two there, and then I would be balanced. Last but not least, combustion. Combustion reactions always start with a carbon-containing compound, an oxygen gas, and then you produce water and carbon dioxide. They're very, very boring. So I have methane plus oxygen gas making CO2 and making two waters. Notice everything is balanced. All right, so with that review done, now we can finally, and I mean finally, talk about only the first part of this, which is precipitation reactions. I know you're thinking, what about the other two? Oh man, this would be like a two hour long video if I didn't break it apart into chunks. So we're just going into precipitation reactions. So what is a precipitation reaction? It is a double displacement reaction in which a solid is forming. What is a precipitate, right? Let's talk about that. When ionic compounds dissolve in water, the solution contains ions. And remember, those ions are all separated. And so because they're all separated, they can recombine when you mix them together with other ions. So a precipitate is a solid that forms because you are now recombining these ions together in your solution. So for example, let's say I mix, um, huh, that's pretty funny. Um, I didn't think that chromate was going to be in this example, but uh, potassium chromate and uh, barium nitrate, right? They're aqueous solutions. Let's say I mix them together. In reality, what happens are the barium ions will actually you know, make little friends, let's say, with the chromate ion, and I would make barium chromate as a solid in my solution. So this is actually what it would look like. So you can kind of tell based on our picture here, our pink things here, those are going to be potassium, our purple things, those are going to be barium. And then I have my nitrate, which looks like this, and I have my chromate, which looks like that. So this would be my first solution, right? They are just, you know, they are free to combine. I mixed them together, and now they're going to be combining together. Notice that the purples are going to pair up with the chromates, though, and I'm going to get a solid here. And then I'm just going to have my potassium, and I'm going to have my nitrates just floating around still in the solution. So in reality, this is what barium chromate looks like, by the way. It's kind of this uh, pale yellow solid. And then I have my clear solution. You might think, oh, there's nothing in this clear solution, really, right? Nope, there are these guys floating around in there, but since they dissolve easily in water, they're just, you know, kind of floating around, not really visible to you unless you were to actually look at the chemistry involved. Okay. So keep that in mind. Um, also, another thing to keep in mind here is notice that everything is balanced in this picture. I know that sounds weird, <laughs> but notice that based on the number of bariums that I have here, I have two bariums. That means I should have four nitrates then in my picture, and I do. I have four nitrates. Here I have four uh, uh, potassiums. That means I should have two chromates in my picture, which I do. I have two chromates. So it's important when you're drawing a a particle diagram for something like this, that you count and make sure that the number of things that you're drawing are accurate. Because the last thing you would want is to accidentally have extra um, little circles representing things that wouldn't be in the actual picture itself. All right, let's talk about precipitates. How can we find them? What are they? So the way that we like to de define a precipitate are precipitates are insoluble, first of all. It's a solid, does not dissolve in solution. We use S when we're doing a reaction equation because it doesn't dissolve. If it does dissolve, though, if it's soluble, then we use AQ, and so that means that it easily dissolves in the solution that we're looking at, okay? Insoluble and slightly soluble are often used interchangeably, by the way. So sometimes you'll see, oh, that's insoluble. Sometimes you'll see it as slightly soluble. So it's kind of like one of those half empty, half full kind of things. But in reality, they are used interchangeably. Just realize that I'm going to use insoluble, but that doesn't mean they won't use slightly soluble on tests and stuff. So here are a simple list of solubility rules. Most nitrate salts are soluble. Most alkali metal groups are soluble, including ammonium also. They get thrown in with that. 
Most chloride bromide and iodide salts are soluble with notable exceptions. We have silver, we have lead two, and we have our mercuric stuff. We have our mercury here. Most sulfate salts are soluble, except for we have barium sulfate, uh, lead two sulfate. We've got our nice mercury here again. Um, and then we have our calcium sulfate. Most OHs are only slightly soluble. Again, we have, again, slightly soluble. Um, and then again, right here, we have our list of soluble ones, though. And then most sulfide, carbonate, chromate, and uh, I almost said potassium, uh, phosphate salts are only slightly soluble unless they are, you know, again, alkali metals. So if you're wondering, what do you need to remember? What is the AP test going to actually ask you about? All you really need to know are these first two. Nitrate salts are soluble. Alkali metal and uh, ammonium are also going to be soluble. That's it. The rest of these are just bonus, but they're useful. So still make sure you know them, but they're just not really tested, let's say. So here's a concept check. Which of the following ions form compounds with lead 2 that are generally soluble in water? And so remember, lead was one of those ones that showed up in like all of those rules saying that it was insoluble. But remember, nitrate, good old rule number one there, uh, nitrate salts are soluble no matter what. So even lead nitrate is soluble in water. So let's talk about the different types of um, reaction um, equations we can have. So a formula equation or a molecular equation, that gives you the overall stoichiometry, but not necessarily the actual forms of the reactants and products in the solution. So reactants and products are generally shown as just full compounds. So for example, um, this is how we were writing them when we were doing our double displacement reactions, right? So I have silver nitrate, I have sodium chloride solution, and I'm making silver chloride, which is a solid, by the way, that's my precipitate then, and I'm making um, sodium nitrate. So look at this. This is just telling me the amounts of stuff, basically, and that's it. So I, it actually is already balanced. So it's already stoichiometrically balanced for us. Now, when I mix them together, though, what actually is going on, right? So what we call the complete ionic equation is the most kind of, let's say, the most detailed way of looking at an equation. All substances that are strong electrolytes, though, are represented as ions. So I would break them apart. Silver and nitrate. Strong electrolyte here, right? I'm going to break them apart. They're ionic. Uh, sodium and chloride. Again, strong. Breaking them apart. They're ionic. This can't be broken apart because it is, according to the solubility rules, forming a precipitate. And then these are, again, going to be written as, you know, separated because they are strong electrolytes. Now, what's the net ionic equation, right? That only shows those solution components that are actually undergoing a change. So notice that when we wrote our complete ionic equation, so I'm going to go back. When we wrote the complete ionic equation, everything was written like this. But notice that on this side and on this side, I have nitrate. I can basically consider those, um, we call them spectators, but I can cross them out. Here, I have sodium. I could cross those out also. And so in reality, what I'm left with is what we call our net ionic equation. So I'm left with silver ions and chloride ions making silver chloride. And so what we call the sodium and the nitrate ions that I crossed out, we call those spectators. Spectator ions do not participate in the reaction directly. That doesn't mean that they're not there. They are literally spectators. They are just looking at the reaction happening, but they're still floating around. So let's see if we can write all three for a reaction. So we're going to mix cobalt to chloride and we're going to mix sodium hydroxide together. And so I want you to write the molecular formula, the complete ionic equation, and the net ionic equation and see if you can get everything right. Okay, so cobalt to chloride and sodium hydroxide. First of all, let's make sure that you know how to write your actual formulas for these. So cobalt to chloride looks like this, sodium hydroxide looks like this. Cobalt to hydroxide is what you would be making, right? So we're pairing up this with that. And then our sodium and our chloride are getting together to make some salt water, and we're going to get that. Okay. So notice that you have to stoichiometrically balance it in order to make your complete here formula equation. So you can't leave them out. Everything has to be balanced still. Notice our states of matter. So this is going to be our precipitate. All right, complete ionic equation. Oh, goodness, this is going to look hideous. Here's this side. Notice all the aqueous things break apart. So everything's broken apart. 
opposite side. Notice our precipitate is together and then everything else gets broken apart. All right, now also make sure you remember this, right? So uh, our, what are our spectator ions if I asked you that? Spectator ions are going to be anything that I cross out. So that would be our sodiums here and our chlorides. Those are our spectator ions. All right, now what about the net ionic equation? It would look like this. Notice that everything is still stoichiometrically balanced in each step, right? So the twos are still here. Here I have two hydroxides to make this. So still everything is going to be um, stoichiometrically balanced each step of the way. All right, so how do we solve stoichiometry problems now that we know all of this information? First thing it asks, identify the species that are present in the combined solution, determine what the reaction is, write the balanced net ionic equation, calculate the number of moles, determine which reactant is limiting, calculate the moles of product if, you, if that's required, and then convert your grams or other units as required. So it looks an awful lot like those stoichiometric things we were doing in unit three. All right, so there are four parts to this, okay? This is a big one. 10 milliliters of a 0 0.30 molar sodium phosphate solution reacts with a 20 milliliter, uh, sorry, with 20 milliliters of a 0.2 molar lead to nitrate solution. Assume no volume change. In other words, we can ignore densities here. Write the molecular equation, the net ionic equation for the reaction. Will a precipitate form? All right, so let's see if you remember your formulas for sodium phosphate here and for lead to nitrate. All right, let's see. And by the way, again, since it's molecular, I'm going to balance it all, right? So balanced. Boom. Look at that. That is sodium phosphate, Na3PO4. That is lead to nitrate. They are both aqueous. Here, I've got another aqueous little product, right? I've got my sodium nitrate. Lead to phosphate, that's going to be my precipitate. It's going to be my solid. Now let's write the net ionic though. The net ionic would look like this. Notice again the, stoichi the stoichiometry is still followed. So it's two phosphates, three lead twos to make this solid. So keep that in mind. All right, part two. How much precipitate will form? That's a lot harder. Let's think about what we have here though. Look, I can figure out how many moles of sodium phosphate I have. I can figure out how many moles of lead two nitrate I have. Let's do that. So I have 0 0.0030 moles of sodium phosphate. I have 0 0.0040 moles of lead to nitrate. Again, I just used the nice little uh, molarity equation. It looks an awful lot like the dilution equation, but still it's the same thing. It's really just actually the same thing. That's how you find the number of moles. All right, now what do I need to know in order to move on to the next part of this? I need to figure out which one of these, if I mix them together, am I actually going to be running out of first? So that equation that I wrote before, aka that nice balanced stoichiometry that I did for my balanced equation, I'm going to need to use that. All right, let's figure it out. What's my relationship? It's a one to two ratio between this and that. That means that if I were to use this as my limiting reactant, I would get 0 0.0015 moles of my product that I'm looking at here. If, on the other hand, I use this, I'd be dividing by a 1 over 3 ratio, and I would get 0 0.0013 through 3 moles instead. And by the way, it is 1.3. Uh, this 1333 goes on infinitely. Okay? So think about it. Remember, what do I know about limiting reactants? It's whichever one of these is smaller is going to be my limiting reactant. So in reality, lead to nitrate is my limiting reactant. So this is what I'm going to run out of first. That's what I needed to know. Great. Now... I know that I have this many moles of lead to phosphate um, produced. All I need to do is convert that from moles to grams, right? So crazy high molar mass, but 1.1 grams. Now, if you're thinking, hey, like there's a lot of numbers and stuff going on here. Why is it just 1.1? I am limited by the significant figures here. So this has three sig figs. This has two sig figs. My answer should only have two sig figs. Remember, we round at the end. If you round early, like if I were to round this just to 0 0.001, I would get nowhere near 1.1 probably. So always round at the very, very end. Don't round too early. All right. That's kind of hard though, right? Next, part three. What is the concentration of nitrite ions left in solution after the reaction is complete? 
Now I'm going one step further. What is the concentration of nitrate ions? Okay, well, let's first of all remember something. Nitrate was a spectator. So that means that however much nitrate I started with is how much nitrate I'm going to end with. Okay? So if I go back to my first kind of bit that I was looking at, I had 0 0.0040 moles of lead to nitrate. Okay? That means that my nitrate is going to be double, right? Because if I had one lead, it would be this amount. If I had two nitrates, though, it's going to be double. So I actually have 0 0.0080 moles of nitrate ions. Now, okay, for the last part, I need to know my volume of this. What's the volume of this solution? And a lot of times people would pick the wrong thing. A lot of times people would say, oh yeah, right here it says 20 mils. But think about this, right? What's the total volume? I'm mixing 20 mils of this with 10 mils of that. That means it's 30 mils, so 0 0.030 liters. That means that now I can find my molarity by just doing 0 0.008 divided by 0 0.03. When I do that, I get 0.27. So the molarity of nitrate ions would be 0.27 molar. Why two sig figs? Because again, I'm limited here by two sig figs. Don't round too early. All right, let's take it a step further and make it even a little harder than that. What is the concentration of phosphate ions? Now, phosphate is harder. Why is phosphate harder? Because phosphate is not a spectator. So I was making some lead to phosphate, but there's going to be some extra phosphate stuff floating around in my solution. Why? Because, again, I ran out of this stuff first. So since the sodium phosphate here was in excess, I'm going to have some phosphate floating around in my solution at the end. So this is going even one step further. All right, so let's recap. Again, I had 0 0.0030 moles of this. That was from like part two. That means that phosphate-wise, it's the exact same. Look, right? If I were asking for sodium, that'd be different, but phosphate is a one-to-one -one ratio, so that's nice. What about at the end, right? So I made 0 0.00133 moles, and remember this three went on forever. That means that the phosphate that I produced in my um, precipitate was about 0 0.0027. That means if I subtract these two, that would tell me how much excess there was, how much extra stuff there was. So in reality, I had about 0 0.0003 moles of extra phosphate stuff floating around in my solution at the end. And remember, what was our volume at the end? It was 20 and 10. That's 30 milliliters. So in reality, my molar solution would be 0 0.01. Now, I should add another digit <laughs> because I need to but I didn't for some reason. So it's about 0 0.01 molar though. And so that is again a crazy example of some stoichiometry you might be asked to do with a precipitate reaction. But again, as, as long as you know the logic of what's happening, you can follow the entire process from start to finish. So hopefully that helped, it, helped you out a little bit. If you have any questions, let me know.